Hello doll friends, happy World Doll Day. Uh, today we have a very special program for you and I would put this in the classification of American Masters. And I have my good friend here, Sue Nile, who's gonna teach me all about the masterworks of Dorothy Heiser. So I don't know anything, except I know I want one of your dolls. <laughs> I don't know anything, but teach me about Dorothy Heiser. Okay, well, let's start at the beginning then. At, in the beginning, Dorothy Heiser was born in 1881, and she lived until she was in her 90s, and she made dolls, and the majority of her production was done from the time she was 60 until the time she was 81. She was, she was a late bloomer then? She was a late bloomer. So for all of us that people say, you're too old to do that, <laughs> there's hope. <laughs> it, so what you're saying, she's the Colonel Sanders of doll makers. She is. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, she started very early and had some training in making dolls. She started off when she was nine years old. She was given two very expensive dolls, but she wanted a real lady doll. So she beheaded both and put the head with the hair she could comb on one doll and the body of the lady doll on the So she was already together. creative as a child. She was already creative. Now she was lucky because her parents didn't say, how could you do that? Um, they appreciated the fact that she was trying to be creative and let it go. So by 10, she was making paper dolls that were actually being sold at Schwartz in Philadelphia. Oh, wow. So that was uh, for a 10-year-old having a job? Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, and at the time, her. we're talking about she's 10 years old, it's 1890s. She's selling them for about $3.50. Wow. For yeah. a set of paper dolls? Yeah. Oh, that was good money. It was. It was excellent money at the time. So she started off early. She went to the Philadelphia Academy of Arts and wanted to learn portraiture, human sculpture, and um, also to learn a little bit more about art. And unfortunately, after three and a half years, she had a nervous breakdown and left school. And it happens. It does. <laughs> And um, in the 1904, she moved to Colorado um, and met her husband out there, and they lived out there. Now, unbelievably for us now, they lived in an almost pioneer situation, and she didn't know how to cook, she didn't know how to sew, and she had to learn all these skills. And her mother-in-law and sister-in-law taught her a lot of her sewing skills. Well, that's hard to believe when when, when you see so, the end results. So, yes, yes, yes. So um, that's where she was. She raised a family, and then they came back to uh, New Jersey, Essex Falls. And in the twenties, that's when she started her actual doll making career. Um, she dressed some dolls for a church bazaar, and wanted to see if they'd sell. They did. Um, her daughter suggested she make a rag doll the next year for the bazaar, and she made a flat-faced rag doll. She wasn't pleased with it, and they eventually developed into something like this. Well, I mean, these are incredible, um, really doll sculptures, I think, and, and cloth. So where do you want to start? Well, we'll probably start, actually, with the Alice in Wonderland trio which we have here. Um, and we were lucky to get these. Julie Bluis offered to lend them to us for the discussion on the Heiser dolls. These dolls were made in probably 1929 um, and are some of her early work. And I'd like to point out, if you look at Alice's face. And it's a wonderful face. And it's more stylized than you're going to see on her later dolls. It's a great doll, though. Um, this is just a wonderful. Well, movie. was she in 1929? Was she still kind of finding her way with what she? No, did? by then she'd already had clients established, okay. right. 
and started selling to re- regularly to clients and certain um, museums, stores were already starting to buy her things. I think the first big sale she had was in 1923. Um, she there was a silk company that asked her to do a doll of Irene Castle, and it sold for a hundred dollars. Oh, are any of those existing still? I don't know. Um, that one um, sold for about a hundred dollars, which is about twenty six hundred dollars today. There are early dolls out there. Um, obviously, these are from six years later. But um, she did a lot of dolls that um, she tried to um, start getting into the market. She did a pattern for Modern Priscilla uh, magazine, and um, she sold kits where you could make dolls. Um, Then she progressed as time went on and people saw her talent. Uh, One of her big things was that she didn't like the way a lot of the dolls at the time especially cloth dolls, had a round head on a neck, and she felt it looked like somebody had just taken an apple and stuck. Sure, like a moon. Yeah. 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 And so she tried to change the angle of the neck. Well, and you can really see it on, like, the ugly duchess, um, that she really understood the human... Anatomy. Anatomy, Mm mm-hmm. So what she does is she sets that head forward. So there's, it's not that neck bone doesn't come up through the center of right. the head. Like you would see on any good mannequin or uh, where it's really trying to, it's not an imaginary human form. Right, and so. So what was her point of sale? Did she have an agent or did people find her? People How? found her. She did um, sell through some stores and some agents at the time. Most famously, probably, Velvely Dickinson was oh. one of her agents. And as we all know, she was a master spy. Yeah. So. yeah, I'm sure she didn't like to bring that up after the fact. It was interesting because Ann Coleman found a letter in her files that talks about how uh, Velvely suggests she starts doing 10-inch dolls instead of some of the larger ones that you see here. Um, so the 10-inch dolls would be like so. I mean, it is amazing. Well, look at the size of my hand when you realize that this is tiny. I mean, and... And the detail. And the detail. And the styling. Did she have any training in, in costume design or... Uh, From a very young age, she was always interested in costuming, and she actually made a lot of her own clothes when she was young, and a lot of times they were a little outrageous for the time. Oh, okay. And then here's another. Another 10-inch. And she was also, I think, a master with wig making. I mean, not that they're wigs. I don't think they're wigs. Are they wigs? No, she was making the, uh, or doing the hair herself. Okay. So is it inserted into the cloth, or is it a cap? Um, it's inserted into the cloth. Okay, so, I and mean, I don't there would be no way, there would be no classes for her to learn this at that time. Did she just have to, she had to experiment herself? She experimented herself. Um, some of the earlier ones, you'll see that she did different techniques and was trying different types of threads and doing different things in order to achieve what she wanted to get to. Well, we should also look at, I mean, here's a, a, the, the Mad Hatter. He's just I fabulous. I mean, we kind of jumped back in time, but he, we can't ignore the Mad Hatter. No, the the facial expression is great. I mean, just he and the Duchess both have wonderful facial expressions. Now, I can see that the material, we say they're cloth, but it appears to me, Sue, that it's some kind of like a crepe fabric for the She for did use skin. a crepe for the skin and um, initially started off dyeing the crepe and eventually went to painting it. She would use watercolors to paint the tone of the skin. Okay, so she'd pick kind of maybe a medium flesh tone and then add on to it? Yes. Okay. So the early ones are probably dyed. Uh, The later ones, you can see, are probably uh, done with the watercolors. Much more delicate looking as far as the coloring, I think. Now, to get the shape, how did she mold 
the face? Did she have a mold that she pressed the fabric into? She would start with a copper wire armature and okay. it has joints instead of one continuous wire. The early ones were one continuous wire, but she jointed the later ones so she could pose. But she would start with a sketch that she wanted the doll to look like at the end. And one of the things I loved was she said, um, she took what other people had on paper and created from that. So a lot of her dolls that you'll see, like the Madame Recamé here, or the Empress Eugenie, we recognize from- Oh, sure, for the Vinterhalter portrait. It's totally of uh, right, right. I mean, she should be sitting with a whole bunch of ladies in waiting. Um, so, you know, it sounds, how you describe the body, it sounds a lot like George Stewart. Yes. yes. So I wonder if George Stewart was, because she's a generation before him, if he was inspired by her or it was just in the air. And, and what's amazing to me is a lot of these doll makers, especially the early doll makers that we talk about, are inventing this as they go. There's no internet. There's no way to look this up or ask someone a question. You write that question and you wait weeks sure. and months to get a reply. If you ever do. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's fabulous work. And I think when people talk about her being a cloth sculptor, I think that's true. Now you notice none of the dolls have seams on their faces, and if you look very carefully, there's a seam under the chin. And that's how she formed the face. I can see it now. In California, we'd call that dental work. <laughs> <laughs> you had a little dental work under your chin. But I think it's wonderful, and she shaped the eyes with little wooden beads under that crepe To skin. give it a little a Just, definition. Yes, yes. And she formed the noses with organdy. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So she just put organdy underneath it? Yeah, and, and folded it until she got the shape of the nose she wanted. Speaking of beadwork, this beadwork is unbelievable. Phenomenal. It's phenomenal. And she had to love doing that because no one would do that unless they loved doing it. She loved doing that, but it was also the source of some of her problems. Um, she did a Princess Elizabeth II in a wedding gown, um, and she sewed 45,000 seed pearls and rhinestones onto the dress. Oh, my God. And suffered a nervous breakdown as a result. Well, no one made her do it. <laughs> And there's a wonderful copy of a letter um, that is out there where she, uh, her son is apologizing to the client um, that Madame Pompadour won't arrive at the same time as Louis XV because it took a lot out of her to sell, so on the 11,000 pearls in the oh fleur-de-lis fleur design on oh his cape. God. So She was dedicated. She was dedicated, but the precision from the very beginning, the way the head is set on the neck, um, the detail on the beading, how true she is to some of the portraits. You see that and you know this is a lady who believed in that kind of work. Now tell me, um, I know that you just mentioned the difficulty, the difficult dolls to produce. How many dolls did she produce annually? Do you have any? Is well, there any? not necessarily annually, but Helen Bullard talks in her book um, about who's a, who's a contemporary? Who's a contemporary of hers? About the fact that from 1940 to 1961, she counted uh, with Dorothy um, that she made about 367 dolls. So even if you take that backward and say she did an equal number or around that number from when she started in the 20s, we're talking probably 700 dolls. And that's not that many. That's not that many. And, and what is really interesting is, I think of these as artist dolls, but now they're getting to the point that they're, they're, all, they're going to be antiques soon. Oh, these, in just a matter of years, yeah, are talking 100 years 100 old. 100 years old. Um, now, 
I love and I've always admired her uh, historical characters and her literary characters when I've seen them, but I didn't, you know, to, but I didn't really realize the incredible taste level and the style that she had until I saw her contemporary fashionable figure. So, I mean, I think she's got 1940 down like no other doll maker's ever done it. The jewelry's perfect, the handbag, the gloves, the shoes, the stockings. I mean, the snood, the hat. I mean, it's just out of this world. And I have to point out that she's carrying a cigarette. Well, of course she would carry a cigarette in 1940. And at the time when um, this doll came up for auction, there were, uh, anti-smoking was at its height, and there were a lot of people who were turned off by that. I thought it was a great I th example I think that's, of the time. I mean, it, like, what are we going to do, cut out of all the Betty Davis movies, the smoke scenes? I mean, it's... It's just that time. Now, how many... Did she do a lot of these fashionable ladies? She did not. Um, that was uh, probably a lower production. People liked... Yeah, they the were living that. Yes. They didn't need... Sleep. They loved the royalty. They loved the beadwork, the intricate gowns, all those kinds of things. Even in some of the smaller historical portraits, you don't see as many of those around. No. Um, you tend to see Catherine the Great and Isabel of Castile and things where you can see her beadwork and everything else. But this has just got, the, I mean, the, the right fabric, the right jewels, the right, I mean, it's... Just, I mean, it, uh, to me, that when I think it as a collector, I mean, I'm so envious of you for having this, but as a collector, I think this is a doll that captures that era probably better than I've seen anywhere else because the shoes are right, the hose is right, the dress is right, the underwear. I mean, that's really kind of a remark because she was there. It is. And I just think she's wonderful. I had always wanted a Heiser, and the first one I saw, I think, was 1985. <laughs> I'm dating myself here, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it was one of her modern Priscilla dolls. It had been made for an advertisement of the type of thing you could do. It had an aviator costume. Oh, fine. It had a ski costume. It had something like 32 or 35 pairs of shoes oh my God. in the trousseau. Oh I went crazy God. for this doll. Oh. So it, that started me on the hunt. <laughs> so are, are those uh, modern Priscilla patterns, are those floating around? I haven't been able to find any. Really? But they may okay. be out there. <laughs> yeah. okay. If you know of any, let us know. <laughs> Put it in the comment. Um, but I think, I think you can see the progression of her work with just these few dolls. You can see how she went from that much simpler, stylized face, I feel, to the more detailed face that you see in The Lady of 1940. Well, Sue, I really appreciate this, and I know that our attendees uh, were, will really appreciate because these are not, these are very rare items. I mean, if you just take the numbers of how many were created, it's probably of all the dolls we've talked about in Doll Week, uh, or a Doll Day, it's... Um, More limited than a lot. It's, it is, and that, that we're just lucky to have this group of uh, pieces to, to look at and um, enjoy. And, um, and I know you're gonna do a lot more. This, this one has all the information, so I know you're gonna do a lot more work on this subject matter. So I wanna thank you very much for being with us and sharing these wonderful dolls. And I would like to thank Anne Coleman, who uh, lent us her ma Madame Recamé, and that Julie Blue was Julie, again. Yeah, it's very, that, very that. generous of them to share their things, and, uh, and it's really also nice of them to give them all to me. <laughs> Bye-bye, doll friends. Bye.